Welcome all to, in, to in, in, Inside Chess 05. It's a pleasure to have you all here uh, and to share some good, good story, story, stories tonight. As, al as always, I have my lovely co host uh, Art Artem, and today we have a special biggest speaker, Louisa from PHMG. <laughs> and she made, <laughs> she made the big tra travel today. To, to here, uh, now she's going to, t to t t tell us a little bit more about herself. Hi, evening everyone. So I think I've met nearly everyone, but hopefully I'll get a chance to speak to you afterwards. So my name's Louisa, and yes, I've come down from Manchester, especially for this chat. Um, a little bit about me. So I've worked in customer experience and insights for around six years now. And before that, I worked in customer service at the co-op. So I worked in co-op insurance for nearly eight years. Um, B2C business, massive business. Uh, started as... Um, uh, call centre advisor, worked through, became an um, academy coach, team manager, and then I really wanted to do something that was a little bit more, how can I help people a little bit more um, than just the customers that my team speak to on the phone. And our head of customer experience did a talk and told, told our team what customer experience really was, and I thought, that's where I want to be working in. Um, so a role came up on its team, and I worked there for four years, um, and then because progression wasn't, that there wasn't, no one had moved above me for me to move into their role. I found myself looking for a new role and now I work at PHMG, which is a B2B business. Um, we do audio branding, so we sell on hold music, music tracks for videos, any sort of audio channel you can think of. So I've been a client insights manager there for 18 months now. Uh, before I joined, there was no insights function, so I really built that, uh, brought in a voice of the customer program, growing the team, so we've got a team of two now and hopefully that will expand in the future um, so hopefully I know this um, topic is always of interest it's always been of interest to me whenever I've gone to chats or speaking to peers in my network so hopefully I can tell you some about some of the things that I've done um, and hopefully even if you come away learning one little thing that you might not have known before then hopefully that'll be a success so hopefully it'd be interesting for you to hear from me this evening Brilliant. thank you I guess let's dive right in so you mentioned client service experience at call has it helped you to better understand clients? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm a big advocate that everyone should do at least some time working in a service job, whether that's hospitality, retail, <laughs> they probably lots of nods, everyone's probably done those kind of jobs. Because I think that the learning that you get about human behavior, you can't replicate that in a classroom, you can't learn about that from a book, can you? Just the, the great British public, the great European public, and um, the people that we work with all the time, you know, you just see so much human behavior. So I think as well as kind of getting to understand human behavior, you also sort of get to know how to interact with people with different styles from yourself. So you might come across people who are, you know, maybe don't fit your learning style or um, the way you express yourself. You know, I talk a lot with my hands, but I know a lot of people don't. So it, it kind of teaches you how to um, engage with different audiences. But also there's the concept of Gemba as part of lean methodology about being on the shop floor and really understanding. So I think you also, when you're working in those roles in a business, you also understand the problem. So we are working insights and those functions, but the teams who are actually speaking to our customers and clients are the ones who can probably tell us the problems without us even having to speak to customers. So it helps us pull all of those strands together. So I think there's lots of different different things and yeah, it just gives you a real appreciation of how to engage with many types of people, I would say. Amazing. Uh, so in in the last role, so now at BHMG, you have external and internal clients. Mm -hmm. So can you explain us the difference and how do how do you how how do you uh, speak with both of them to your exter external and internal clients mm -hmm. and the definitions may be yeah. as, as well. Yeah, so my so my internal stakeholders can be anyone from our account managers who speak to our clients all the way up to the board, so our chief operating officer and our owner. So I've got to think about the different audiences and how we engage with them. But I think there's some similarities in how you interact with your external clients as well, because regardless of whether they're internal or external, it's either a problem or an opportunity 
issues that you're looking to solve for them. So if we go in and do an interview or a focus group, you want to unpick what that customer problem is so you can fix that. But also at a business level, you want to know from you know the senior stakeholders, what's the business problem they're trying to solve and marry those two together. So I think there's a lot of common factors. Um, but again, as I think I said, as I said in the first question, it's, it, it's knowing that audience and knowing how they like information being presented to them as well, I think is really key, especially if you're a numbers person, I think it really resonates whenever you're, if they're comfortable with numbers, um, and a lot of stuff we do is qual, it's how do you kind of make that numerical in a way without kind of losing that human aspect, so I think just the balance of, I think speaking to external stakeholders in the way that they are usually spoken to can kind of be that first step in the door to kind of push the insights agenda, or at least that's how I've tried to kind of yeah. push it at PHMG. <laughs> Perfect. So how do you actually customise and personalise that experience for the customer, in that case, when delivering insights? Um, so lots of different ways. So I think um, our board are presented information a lot in PowerPoint, so I know PowerPoint is usually probably the, the favoured one, but I think um, what's been very powerful, certainly this job and, and previous roles, is video content, so actually hearing it straight from, from the clients, because I think it's harder to add argue with that because you can probably argue with a start on a page can't you or a quote but if you've got a video of one of your clients especially maybe if it's one of your high profile clients or someone who um, fits one of your personas or something that can really they can identify who that is within your organization you can't really argue with that so I'm a big fan of video interviews as being a, a methodology for sure so do you embed that into the presentation or how do you sniff yeah it a little bit of mix of everything so yeah embed it in or um, we did some quite lo-fi stuff I'm just thinking of some examples that we did when we were at co-op so I'm sure a lot of you'll know trying to do insight on a budget is that a theme that some of you have had no budget of zero <laughs> sometimes we can't say um, there was one I was thinking about this on the train down actually because I think sometimes you have a budget of zero it forces you to be more creative I think than when you've got like thousands of pounds sitting behind you because you can you can maybe think oh okay I can go and get that all singing and all dancing solution whereas if someone says you've literally got nothing what can you do with it um, and I remember we were looking at um, a proof of concept for our student insurance when I was working at co-op so um, a little bit like um, pay as you go sort of insurance we were trying to see whether that be something that people were interested in and with a budget of zero and, and we did have a budget of 20 pound I went and got some cost of vouchers <laughs> to go and do it but I said you know give me 20 quid and we'll do that there was a student night in the Manchester Randale so you know they hand out freebies and stuff in um, in freshers week so me and one of the other guys on the project we just kind of spent a couple of hours in the evening just kind of going and <laughs> ambushing people <laughs> ambushing students and kind of just finding a little bit more so I think we only did about six questions did some videos got some consent forms but it was a really kind of quick and e quick and dirty you might want to call it but do something where when you play back what what our target market were actually saying you know those students the key thing that we found is that it's not the students who are bothered about the insurance it's the parents so that was one of the things that we wanted to you know sell it on it's your parents or you know your guardian wanting to make sure that you're safe when you go to university as a student you're not bothered are you? you've got your phone you've got your laptop if it gets broken someone else will deal with it so we kind of flipped of who that target market was going to be uh, you know for the sake of 20 quid and a couple of us doing three hours you know there was there was a real benefit to that Okay, good. How, and how do you en ensure that the data and the, ins the, and the insights that you provide for your internal clients that they are actually like actionable? Mm. Which is a tough one. And again, I'm sure another thing that um, a lot of people come across. I think um, sometimes as an insights function, you feel that you need to be all things to all teams. I don't know, I certainly feel like that. And there's a lot of different things that you're being asked to do. And I think part of it is actually finding out who your champions are within the different teams. So there will be, you will have customer champions within your organisation. Certainly when I joined PHMG, it was one of the things I wanted to do in my first kind of, you know, not even 90 days, I think I put it down to my first 30 days. Who actually is bothered about client experience? You know, who's kind of passionate about it? Whose role isn't insights, but who can you kind of work with? Um, and it's making sure that you tie what I've always found is that tying it to the financials is really key to kind of getting those actions signed off so what is what difference is it making to the bottom line you know how much are you saving or how much are you making by making those changes and yes it can be a little bit difficult to do that um, but if you've got connections or you've built those stakeholder relationships to kind of prove prove what the benefit is and then I think the action then 
happens or you at least push it and I think um, not being the one to do the action which I think is a trap we sometimes fall into in insights is being like well I found the solution I'll, I'll go and do it we're really we need to be focusing on finding the problems and pushing it to the teams who can do it okay we might have to keep nudging them it's a little bit like if I was doing it I know I'd do it quicker but it's better when someone else kind of takes the bat on and, and fixes it so I think uh, making it relevant knowing who your champions are um, and just keeping on top of them to kind of keep that momentum going is is how I would say for that one follow up on that uh, I really love that term cost customer champion do you internally with your team I assume that you know who are those yes. around the organization yeah. and those yeah. are like your like your best friends and favorite yeah, people definitely, definitely. And, yeah. do you, and do you have them in mind when you are doing like certain like project like projects to bring them in to assure the mm -hmm. others so that they know that that the uh, things that that they need in that they need in like like in like like insight so the main part is do you do you use them in any like convincing way for for some other parts of the or, or, or organization yeah i would definitely say so so um Again, sometimes we can go down that trap of working in silo, can't we? You work with the team who are kind of responsible for maybe the change that you're looking into or the problem that you're looking at. Uh, but certainly try and get the people that I've worked with before or the people who are kind of those advocates into those meetings. Um, you know, sometimes it can be quite difficult. I think from the side of the champion, it's easier because you say, you know, can you come and do me a favor? You know, we work well together. Maybe from the other side, it can feel a bit like, well, why is X from that department coming into this <laughs> meeting here? But um, I think you know there's always there's always crossover no matter what department you, you work in I mean if you think of teams like finance who set the budgets well yeah they should be in operational meetings and vice versa you know making sure that everyone has got a seat at the table um, and I think not quite exactly in the line that we're talking about there but one of the things that's very important and what I've tried to do at PHMG is make sure that insights are always in the meetings where decisions are being made so those steering meetings those finance meetings you know we shouldn't be um, an output of the meeting where we just get okay this is the decision that's been made we should be in there helping to make those decisions so we're certainly making tracks in that way um, but yeah definitely having that network and just having those people to call upon you know even a bit of favours isn't it you know if you've done something really quickly for someone you've got a bit of a favour there have it say yeah. can you come in and help me in this one and just show that you know how we've worked together so and are there also like certain traits about them do you see a connection between those did they had a previous job or role like 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 when they engage with the customer more or are there traits about them yeah i think certainly it is the more senior people who either come in from um, entry level in our organisation or from other organisations have said you know we've done customer service roles in the past and have maybe gone through that path I think they're the ones who sometimes are easier champions or easier ones to speak to because they've done it and they understand it um, I think anyone who kind of um, is an advocate of collaboration and learning at work I think are your kind of team teammates to get involved in as well so maybe those ones ones who you see kind of get involved in knowledge shares and things like that you know they're the people to kind of say you know do you want to get involved in my in my project um even so much as people who kind of chat to you in the list because i know that there's not everyone does do they and i think again an insights thing is i think we're all quite i'd say you're usually quite outgoing aren't you in the kind of roles that we do <laughs> um, you know we're all quite chatty people so i think you know when you start having a natural rapport with people um you know you kind of start talking about things and maybe they mention a project you think well i should get involved with that so i think it's just it's just the constant networking of work i think just really helps with these projects okay. Love that. Yep. i think and everybody loves a story right mm -hmm. so what role do you think the art of storytelling actually plays internally oh my gosh i think it's the number one i think it's 
It's the way that you get the message across. As I said, you know, it's not always about, I know we have to kind of do stats for the people who are numbers minded, but there's nothing more powerful than the story. And again, one of the stories I was thinking about, this is again from, from co-op again, I think more so because we were B2C there. And I think you, you remember some of the customers that you spoke to. I remember it was a project we were looking at in motor claims. You know, you've got your different kind of claims where it's fault, non-fault. We were seeing loads where we were paying out massive fault claims and we shouldn't have been um, so my role in that was to investigate why that was happening and it led me down this rabbit hole of this customer and I'm going to call her I'm going to call her Shirley to protect her, <laughs> to protect her uh, real name and her claim had been going on for about three years it had gone back and forth it had changed status so many times and it highlighted that we had a learning and development need in that team and we were able to address that so when I'd been brought in to look at it from a process point of view what I could have done was say I've listened to 20 calls and here's your problems and nothing probably would have happened but I drew an empathy map and I was showing Shirley's journey and how long it's taken and how many renewals and all this the emotion going across it and I think when you humanize it and the same the power of storytelling that story of one customer I think is so powerful that it just it, it's not just saying I've done 20 interviews it's showing a face to this experience that you've had you know we've got someone who's had this claim going on for three years they're worried about it they're going to talk to the husband because they don't know what this terminology means it it just makes you really feel feel for them and uh, the reason I remember it so strongly is that people were mentioning it to me whenever they see me they go I remember Shirley I remember you came and spoke to me it just it's so memorable isn't it and that was what four years ago that I did that and I still remember that experience so I think it just helps with recognition of it and remembering you want people to go away with a memory of what you've told them and what they want to change I think storytelling is the is the number one thing I think with insights 100% agree. And it's also the power of the analogy, right? Yeah. People just remember the funny analogies. They do. Yeah, yeah definitely. Surely, surely it is. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, can you share also a specific example when your like understanding of external client needs like strongly influence the company's dress mm -hmm. strategy and vision may, may, maybe yeah, yeah definitely so above and beyond posh really um <laughs> so in, now at phmg and the role that i do kind of crosses over everything that we do with our clients and our prospects but also um what can we do to kind of prove to our clients that what we provide is valuable? So, works in insurance, again, a, prod a product that doesn't exist, you know, you don't get anything <laughs> at the end of it. I know work in audio branding where, again, there's a product that doesn't exist, so how do you prove value um, to your clients? So, we were looking at, um, one of the team went to a, a conference in Florida with two of our high profile clients and the ask comes in as it always does, have you got some nice stats for the PowerPoint? Well I don't have any stats for Florida for you but let me see what we can do. So we um, we actually used Picato, work with Picato on this project to show the before and after of what those two clients had um, and played it to Floridians. Um, so we were able to present back to say, this is the business benefit that these two have seen from putting our production into, into play. Um, and it was, the recognition was higher, the trust was higher, all the metrics that we went on, and this was a double blind test, they didn't know who the, um, well blind test, they didn't know who the brands were and they didn't know which was before and after, and we saw uplift in all of them. Um, so as it goes, you know, you go, yeah, nice, this has been done for this Florida presentation. Well, next thing, right, we want it in all industries, we want it in all territories, we want to do this, we want to prove the ROI for everything, so it's great, uh, but that has meant that we've now flipped a little bit more into what can we do for our point of sale that actually proves the value of what we're doing. So I'd say that's definitely a point where just one piece of insight where it was for a specific thing, as I say, this Florida conference, which it could have been, I could have had a start and we never would have done the project, but it's just kind of grown arms and legs and grown into this thing where the business has really seen value. Um, so yeah, the kind of the strategy's just changed a little bit there to how can we look at what our end users do to then provide the value to our clients with us being B2B. So just kind of going a step beyond our own clients. So it's certainly a really interesting space to be in and a project there. So yeah, as I say, just get more to do all the time, but exciting, which is, which is you know, where we want to be. I love that. It's almost the Shirley effect in action. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Use That's it. my PHMG Shirley. <laughs> Use it then, then you extrapolate as much as you yeah. can and, and tell the, the, the deep story mm -hmm. and then, yeah. The bait Perfect. as well. But naturally, maybe that's one of the challenges often insights professionals have when connecting with sales and other teams. Mm -hmm. So do you have some others that you may want to highlight? 
Um, yeah, I think, I mean, thinking of challenges, especially when, again, saying about budget and how do you compete when you've got um, other areas kind of wanting a piece of the budget all the time and how do you kind of say, um, you know, the, the money that I want is at the cost of half a head count or whatever it is, you know, you've always got to put it in the real term. So I think the challenge can sometimes be um, trading that off against what the team's KPIs or metrics are as well. So we're trying to make sure we align everything that we do um, and also having a single source of truth. So I don't know how many of you are in teams where you maybe have different insight teams for different functions or people doing maybe little pockets of things. Um, what we found when, when I took over, what, what we'd had previously to me was testimonials and case studies, which had been in a folder and no one had looked at. So again, that was another thing, another piece of insight that was sat there that hadn't been checked for a while. So now just kind of, I see the insights function as being more the governance of it. You don't want to take that autonomy away from the teams to not do those pieces. Um, but it's certainly a challenge as in making sure that people aren't just going off and doing things that might detriment us in some way as well. I think yeah. just having that sort of oversight of it, I think, has really helped. Because if you are a small team, you can't do everything as much as you would like to. So you try to integrate vertically yes definitely yeah I think again going back to the thing of having the seat at the table in all the different meetings as well making sure that you know what's going on because mm. again projects grow arms and legs and someone goes well I used to do a little bit of insight I've done interviews before I'll go and do this and then next thing you know there's a whole project going off that you've not seen before so just kind of making sure that you know what's going on without having to do all of it yourself I think what, and what advice would you give to specific organizations uh, to better align insights and overall com 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 company vision? So one of the things that's worked well for, for us, um, certainly again back at co-op, was having a common KPI or metric across all the teams. So one goal that you're all working towards, because I think again we can all think of times when your KPIs or team's KPIs are at odds with another one. So having one, at least one that everyone's working towards, and ours at co-op was net promoter score. So regardless of what team you were on, if we didn't hit a net promoter score, you either had a, a dent on your bonus or it was, you know, there was something taken away from it so that meant that whatever team you're in products pricing finance up anyone you, you had a reason for doing it above and beyond it being the right thing to do there was a monetary um, gain for you as well so I think having your metrics aligned and having one that runs across all of them um, I think certainly having the right data in the right place and having correct data I think is a again <laughs> A big barrier, how many times do you get a report you go, ah, no, that's not right, I can tell you that's not right. So having data integrity, again, you know, if I knew the solution to that, I'd be a very rich woman, um, be able to cleanse everyone's data for them, but making sure that you're making business decisions off what you know is the right data. Um, and I think, what else would I say on that one? Again, going back to the seat at the table, just making sure that you know who the champions are to get in their ear about stuff and whether you're in that meeting or not. I think we have to be quite resilient as insights professionals. You have to kind of keep talking up all the time. You have to keep pushing the insights agenda all the time. It's like a never ending task, is it? Especially when you've got new people joining, joining your teams and your company. Um, so yeah, I would say that a common metric, common goal you're all working towards um, in all of the meetings, data integrity doesn't matter my three, three cornerstones there we go <laughs> very good it's still tricky right yeah it's how do you almost connect the dots and say to the business this is actually x amounts of pounds yeah. that the team is driving so yeah. in your experience have you found an efficient way to do that yeah, I think there's all sorts of different ROI models. You can get all singing and all dancing. You can pay companies to do it for you. You can do systems. Again, it's only as good as the data that goes in. But I think keeping it simple, because in my experience, any sort of forecasting is, you know, until it happens, you don't know if that's right. Sales forecasting, so, you know, headcount, anything like that. So I think we have to, as insights professionals, we have to have a bit of a commercial, well, a lot of a commercial head, really, and a finance head around it. So even if whatever financial metric you've got, whether that's cost for acquisition, cost of cancellation, anything like that that you can tie onto, and then start looking at what's the, what problems are in that area. And I think once you've proven it once, you kind of have that, 
integrity and you come across as authentic when you've done it that you're maybe not questioned every time that you're doing it i think just proving it the one time can often be enough now okay yeah sometimes your stakeholders might change you might find you have to do it again but i think just keeping that simple roi as i say not you don't have to go in and think right i've got thousands doing this and this ft is this and this time is this just really really simple what's the cost what's the problem you're trying to solve if you were to make a modest improvement how much would that save and you'll find that the trade-off between what a piece of insight or the time that it takes for you to do it is much less than the potential savings, which is, you know, how I've found it's worked yes. in the past. And quick follow-up. Um, do you use your relationships with the people you meet in the elevator or yeah. the other champions? <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, yeah, so our finance team, again, we're probably quite a small finance team, I would say, um, and they're very hard to get hold of. So certainly when you've got time with one of them, it's have your list prepared and get everything off them that you need. Um, but yeah, you know, I know we're desk drive by. Whenever you're the recipient of it, you always think, oh, I'm coming over for this thing. But you know, just going and having a chat with someone and can you just do this? favour can you pull this report or can you show me where it is I'll get it myself I can work it out myself as I say you know it only needs to be a simple model we don't all need to be data scientists although if you are I take my hat off to you because that's a, <laughs> a tough job skilled job to do and one last from me and then uh, we can switch to the Q&A uh, what advice would you give to brands uh, to accept and to get more data driven culture um, so I think it's, at brand level, I think it's giving the Insights team more autonomy to kind of go out and do those things. I think at our level, at Insights Professionals level, it is having those creative solutions and say, if you've got a budget of zero, how do you work around that? Um, you know, your champions, whoever your highest champion is, what's keeping them up at night? How can you make their job easier? As I said, I think at the start of how you look at your internal and your in external stakeholders, if we look at our external cl customers and clients, we want to make their jobs easier. But how do we do that for our internal stakeholders? Because, you know, whether the, the COO or the owner or whatever level on the board, there'll be one product or one metric or something that will think, every time this comes around, it's a nightmare for, for me. And it's hooking on to that. If you can make a difference at that level, um, then that's another way of just kind of opening that. So I think that's the best advice I can kind of give to anyone in this industry is to kind of find out what the, what's upsetting them, fix it, and then you kind of open that up to helping the customers more as well. Yeah, amazing. So right now we can turn to our audience. Do we have a question? Yes, Tom. Um, well, so thinking of a difficult stakeholder, let's say <laughs> probably have that person internally. Um, <laughs> high impact, yeah, high impact, important for the business. Yeah. And, you know, make a lot of difference. And yeah. So on, but don't care about inside. Yeah. Don't understand it, perhaps. Or yeah. Think they know best. How do you manage them? Yeah, it's it is a really tough one, and I think I think with anyone like that, it's it's always ongoing. I never think that you fully kind of you're always. You have to put a lot of effort into those relationships, I find, and sometimes until the penny drops with them. But I think, again, it's talking to them in their language. Like, I'm thinking of people that I know, it tends to be sometimes people who are more possibly commercial-minded or the ones who want it fast-paced all the time. I think it's just kind of proving proving yourself or talking to them in their language, I think, tends to be the way um, that I've certainly found it. And I think also for us, I think not to beat yourself up if you don't always win everyone over, because I think it can sometimes you feel like you have to and you have to get everyone to be a customer advocate. And I'm not saying that we give up on it, but I think being a little bit kinder to yourself and it maybe doesn't go right. I know certainly I can sometimes think, oh, I wish I'd done this a different way but you know we're all human aren't we and there's always another chance to kind of be in front of them and talk to them about something else so I think it's always it's finding their driver and as I said like what upsets them in the business and how can we help them with that I think just kind of helps open those conversations around it and proving that insight isn't always just one type of insight because we didn't even get to that really did we I think insight covers so much than just you know if we all were to define it we probably would all say a different thing wouldn't we um, but it comes from many many areas doesn't it and it's finding what's their what's their hook what's their hook how how do they what's the problem that they're trying to solve yeah 
Can I ask a related question on that? Louisa, I really enjoyed your presentation. Oh, you thank have, you. You have the archetype of the perfect personality for like an inside story. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. You know what I mean? Um, but on that point, you you mentioned the kind of guerrilla marketing approach or yeah. uh, insights approach at co-op, which I found super fascinating. It's very clever. But in your current role, was there was there a sense of what type of insights products you needed for these specific audiences from the beginning, or what was the process of making that decision? Yeah, um, so it's a little a little of a mix. So when I came in to do my interview, they kind of said, you know, here's a problem that we're trying to solve, as, as we always like to go back to. Here's this stage of our journey. How would you gather a client insight at this point? So there was kind of a bit of an understanding that this was the the key part, and it was it's our onboarding journey, which is in most products isn't it it's your key mode of truth it's your journey they've signed up for something you want to deliver on that so that's kind of where I focused a lot of my effort on because I know that's high value to the business it's of interest to the business um, and we had a lot of data internally so whether that was interaction data or positive reviews there was a lot of stuff that I could complement with things like surveys and interviews. So I think part of that was having having a bit of an agenda of how I wanted to approach it. Um, but as you join a business and you think, this, is, this isn't exactly how I thought it was going to work, and then start flexing that and kind of thinking, what else can we prioritise? And in my head, I've always had this vision of having the VOC programme and what are all the long-term milestones that we want to achieve in a certain time but what are the quick wins that can show the value of this team because again you know we're a lot of the time we're at cost to the business we're not a sales team that are bringing in sales all the time are we you know we might be seen as a cost so it's just making sure that we're always providing value whether that is turning on a survey doing a quick deep dive um interview set with some of our highest paying clients um, some market research what's going on with brands who are maybe not us but similar to us so I think it's having the short term and the long term so yes I did have a vision which has flipped a little bit but I think I've definitely ticked off some of the key milestones um, so in general it's gone in the right direction with some deviations along the way as all good journeys do <laughs> Are there any, just following on from that, are there any kind of like red flags that you look for as someone who manages teams that potentially you may see some teams going down maybe a bit of a um, slightly problematic route when it comes to data collection? Yeah, I think um, whenever you hear anything like, oh, just do it, and you think, oh, that's not good. <laughs> you think, that's going to be like really accurate, whatever you're writing in there. Just, oh, no one's looking at, no one's looking at that. That's no, another good one, isn't it? And you think, well, hi, I am, so can you write it down properly? Um, I think, and this is a hard one, because I think there's always a tendency when you've got a KPI, but people who always chase that number. So if you've got a 65%, I don't know, um, conversion rate and people who will do anything to hit that conversion rate I think number chasing but unfortunately I think that's it's the nature of those um, the roles that are KPI driven is that you will want to hit that number no matter what so I think that can be maybe a pink flag we'll say you know kind of a little bit of an indicator there but I think anything where where someone says oh it doesn't matter oh no one's looking at that that's a bit of a oh well you know but then those are almost like, not your champions, but there's a piece there with and those the kind champions. of, yeah. <laughs> 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 the villains of the piece. Um, but educating those teams in kind of the power of insight and again, humanizing it and doing some of, more, more of the fun stuff, you know, maybe some of the collaborative things like, um, you know, I love journey mapping because everyone gets up with the post-it notes and has all different perceptions of what the journeys are. Um, I did one quite recently where, um, I showed an example of a journey map and got everyone to do it where that journey to work was. So it's a common journey that everyone's experienced. So you might think, oh, I don't really know what our clients do, but everyone's had a journey to work. Everyone's had a journey here, haven't they? So you could map your journey. Um, so I think, yeah, there's, when you see people like that, there's a bit of an education piece to kind of bring them on the journey. Because I don't think anyone does anything maliciously at work. I think there's just, everyone's in their own zone aren't they and they've yeah. got their own priorities so yeah red flags to an extent but none that i think you couldn't fix over time is what i like to think <laughs> just do it <laughs> <laughs> do we have any more questions going once <laughs> no i'm joking that's okay if, if we don't have any more 
uh, I would like to say a huge thanks to our Louisa who oh, came here. I think I really enjoyed it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>